All right, so let's get uh, let's get the show on the road. Uh, can everybody hear me? Yeah. Cool. Um, all right. So my name is Runar. I'm going to be talking about adjunctions, uh, sort of in everyday life and and in everyday programming. Uh, so this is a, a sort of a mathematical relationship that comes up uh, all over the place in mathematics, in programming, and just sort of in day-to-day -day life. Yeah, the slides will definitely be available for all the talks. Okay, um, so um, I'm a lead engineer at a company called Taft in San Francisco, uh, and we are pretty aggressively hiring uh, Haskell programmers, uh, doing all kinds of cool stuff with you know purely functional programming and category theory and stuff. So if you're interested in working with me, send me an email. Uh, I work ma mainly in Haskell, but uh, my sort of claim to fame is that I'm uh, an author of this book called Functional Programming in Scala. Um, okay, so Saunders McLean famously said, adjoint functors, or sorry, adjoint functors arise everywhere. Um, so uh, uh, Wikipedia says, uh, the, the Wikipedia article on adjunctions says that an adjoint functor is a way of giving the most efficient solution to some problem via a method which is formulaic. I just think that's an awesome, awesome uh, definition. Uh, so when it, formulaic, by formulaic they mean functorial, or so formula you should think functor. Uh, if we think about that dually, then uh, an adjoint functor is a way of finding the most difficult problem that some formula can solve. <coughs> All right, so um, my goal here is just to show you this pattern of the junctions uh, again and again in different settings. And hopefully you're going to start like seeing it everywhere. You're going to have just like a junction goggles on. And then I want you to like tweet and blog and tell me about all the cool adjunctions that you discover. Okay, so first thing we're going to look at is curry and uncurry. So these are functions that are like super simple uh, in, in uh, Haskell. Oh, this is Haskell notation, but you know, curry and uncurry should exist in any functional language, anywhere where functions are first class. Um, so curry just says that if we have a function that takes a pair of a and b and returns a c, we can turn that into a function that takes an a and returns a function that takes a b and returns a c. So we can uh, take a, a function of a pair and turn that into a function uh, that we can partially apply. All right, so that's curry, and the implementation is straightforward. It takes the a and a b and puts it in a tuple and passes it to f. Uncurry goes the other way. Right? It takes sort of a curried function and turns it into a function of a, of a tuple, right? Uh, super simple things. But so, so these two functions, curry and uncurry, they witness an isomorphism between these two types. So, so these two types are in one-to-one uh, -one correspondence. Uh, so for every one on, on one side, there's an exactly one on the other side. But really what's going on here is that this is a relationship between two functors. And the two functors involved are pair with b, and function from B, right? So, you know, just sort of think about uh, pair with B as, as being F, and then function from B as being G, right? So, uh, so then this is an isomorphism on functions, or on function types, from, uh, so between uh, functions from F of A to C, and functions from A to G of C, okay? So whenever we have this kind of relationship, uh, this sort of natural isomorphism between arrows in any two categories, uh, like categories C and D here, uh, then, then these functors F and G form an adjunction. Uh, so we say that F is left adjoint to G, uh, or conversely we say that G is right adjoint to F. All right, so you see these are two categories C and D. And, uh, and these should be sort of universal, and so, so uh, this should be for all z and x, right? If you have a function, or an arrow, sorry, they're not, not necessarily functions, but an arrow in C from f of z to x, then you should have exactly one corresponding arrow uh, in D from z to g of x and vice versa. And uh, in our curried and uncurried funct functions uh, example, uh, these two functors were pair with s and, and function from s. Um, so here, uh, the two categories involved are hask, so the category of haskell types and functions between them. 
And so then uh, the arrows uh, that are in one-to-one -one correspondence are, you know, the curried functions and, and the uncurried functions, right? Uh, and I want to draw your attention to just sort of an intuition point, uh, which is that uh, the one on the left, the pair with s, is a producer of s's, right? It like, gives you an s. And the one on the right is a consumer of s's, like it, it takes an s, right? And the producer produces exactly what that function requires, right? So it's an optimal answer to that question posed by the function. And conversely, or in turn, uh, that is exactly, so the, the question posed by the function from s is the most difficult question that the pair with s can answer. All right? Cool. So we can capture this idea of an adjunction in a Haskell type class. Uh, if we have two functors, f and g, uh, then we can form an adjunction between f and g just by uh, witnessing this isomorphism. So we say, well, we can take an arrow, uh, you know, from the left to the right, uh, an arrow from f of a to b, and we can turn that into an arrow from a to g of b, and vice versa. So this is a, an isomorphism on these two types, right? Um, and we can give an instance for curry and uncurry, where the isomorphism is just witnessed by curry and uncurry. And what happens if you know we have this this left adjunct operator uh, that you know takes our our, our uh, functions over across this adjunction? If we pass identity to that, so that it'll be identity on f of a, uh, then we get a unit. So we get a function from a to g of f of a, and that's going to be a unit for a monad g f. And we're also going to get a co-unit for a co-monad f g if we pass the identity to the right adjunct operator. And that's just going to like fall out of this thing. Um, so, so then to make an adjunction like this, we just have to specify either this... Uh, these left adjunct and right adjunct witnesses to the isomorphism, or we have to give the unit and the co-unit. Uh, so we can give uh, one or the other pair, and we can, we can define one in terms of the other. Uh, or you could give the unit and the right adjunct, and that would also work. Right? So the minimal implementation is just like some combination of one, th one uh, or left and, and the co-unit, or like unit and, yeah, anyway, you get it. Um, okay, so uh, so then in the, in the sort of diagram, I've collapsed the the like on the on D on the top, I've collapsed the the G of X because because the arrow there is the identity on G of X, and the corresponding arrow is when we you know go across the adjunction to C, we get this co-unit thing that goes from f of G of X to X, and conversely uh, we have this thing called unit. Um, when we take the identity in, in C over to D. And in uh, our, our particular example with curry and uncurry, uh, if we uncurry the identity, uh, we get this, this uh, function or, uh, that uh, takes a pair, an S and a function from, from S to B, and produces a B. And what that does should be pretty obvious, it just takes the s and passes it to the function, right, to give us a b. Uh, the other one, the unit, is curry identity, and what that does should also be pretty obvious. It takes an a, and it produces a function from s to pair of a and s. So it takes an a, and then it takes the s, and it puts the a and s together in a pair. Easy? But, yeah? Yeah, th so these f maps are the f maps for the functors f and g, respectively. And f there is just the argument to left adjunct. Sorry, there's a little bit of punning on f's here. Uh, so the type functor f and the left adjunct f, the argument to left adjunct there, those are two different f's. One of them is a function, the other is a functor. Okay, cool. Yeah. Uh, right, okay, so, so notice that uh, this type unit here, or the type of this unit, it goes from... So the return type 
is uh, s to a comma s. And then, you know, to lots of the sort of, uh, to lots of uh, functional programmers, that should be very familiar. Uh, that's the state type, the state monad. So what we actually got by currying unit was uh, the unit for the state monad. Uh, sorry, currying identity was the unit for the state monad. And we also get a co-unit for a store co-monad on the other side uh, if we uncurry identity. OK, so a quick refresher on state monad. Uh, so uh, this type, uh, I'm just going to call this uh, you know, state SA. And that's just going to be an alias for these functions from S to A, uh, comma S, where the incoming S is just the state before. So, so this models a state machine, a melee machine. And S uh, coming in is the state before the machine runs. And the S coming out is the state after the machine runs. And the A that comes out of it is going to be the output of the machine. And then the, the store thing uh, is basically, so we just take our functors, like function from S and pair with S, and we flip them. So now we have pair with S on the outside and function on the inside. And so, so this thing is going to model like a store. And uh, the way that works is that it's going to be two things. It's going to be uh, a cursor, or sort of a current S. And then we're going to have a function full of A's. So this is going to be a store full of A's that are indexed by S's, and there's going to be a current S that is like the, the cursor into our store. All right? So obviously, we can always get an A out of this, but we can also move the cursor to a different S <clears throat> to get a different A, potentially. OK. so. Uh, to show you that we can actually get the state monad out of this, um, we, can, we can generate the join for the, for the state monad. So, uh, uh, so I show, sort of expanded out these, these types here. So uh, the argument to join is you know, state s of state s a. And, and we collapse that to a single uh, state s a. So what that does is uh, it operates on nested state machines. So uh, the input is a state machine that returns another state machine um, as its output. And what join is going to do is it's going to run the first machine using the, the input state. And it's, that's going to give it a new state machine. And it's going to take the output state of the first machine and pass it as the input state to the resulting machine. And it's going to construct a new machine that does both things. Right? And the implementation of that is just fmap co-unit. Because uh, we can actually think of our uh, nested state machine as a function that takes an S and returns a store. And that store is going to be full of pairs. And that's exactly the stuff that we need to return from our state machine. Awesome? So, so yeah, the, the state monad just like falls naturally out of the simple property is, uh, about function and tuples. And we also have a duplicate for our store co-monad. Um, so what this is going to do is going to take a store full of A's indexed by S's. And it's actually going to produce a store full of stores uh, indexed by S. And so you can think of this as being like, you know, let's say you have a, uh, you know, like a storage silo, and you have like a forklift, uh, which is S. And, and S could have like multiple different uh, positions. And what we're going to do is we're going to think of the state of this forklift as a state machine. Right? So we F map into actually the state monad. So we're now we're going to capture the state of our, of our forklift and then take that whole thing and stick it in the store. So now we have a store full of stores that are in some state. Right? It's kind of crazy. But, uh, but it's awesome. And I'm going to show you why it's awesome here in a minute. OK, so this is a duplicate for a store co-monad. And, and the implementation is just fmap unit. Super simple. But it, but it seems like it does something really complex. <clears throat> OK, so. Uh, just a little refresher on monads and co-monads. Uh, so a monad is a functor. So again, a functor m uh, that just implements fmap, right? Uh, we can get a monad by implementing return and join. So return is going to be our unit from our junction, and join is going to be fmap co-unit. Uh, and then uh, normally we think about, in Haskell, we think about monads as being implemented as return and bind. Uh, and bind is just. Uh, fmap followed by join. And uh, comonad is sort of the exact opposite of this thing. So instead of putting things in, like from A to M of A, 
uh, instead of a, a unit, we have a co-unit extract that goes from you know, W of A to A. W is kind of an upside down M. Um, and then we can duplicate. That is, we can take a W of A or a store you know, of A's and get a store full of stores of A or W of W of A. And the analog of the bind is this sort of co-bind, or sometimes called extend, uh, where we can take a, you know, a W of A and then a function from W of A to B and turn that into a W of, a, uh, w of B. Uh, that's a little bit sort of opaque maybe to think about. Uh, but the name of this thing is extend, which is kind of, kind of cool, because what a coma actually does is that it, it extends a local computation to a global one. So if you have a, a computation that operates on some small part of your data structure, uh, then you can extend that using the comonet to a computation that operates on all positions in your structure. Let's give an example of that. Um, so think of a two-dimensional bitmap uh, that is grayscale. All right, so uh, the int here on the, uh, the right-hand side here, or further, furthest off to the right, that int is going to be some some shade of gray. And the pair of ints, uh, that's going to be our, the index into our store. So it's going to be a store full of ints, and the pair of ints are going to be the x and y coordinates of the pixels. Okay? So this is from an infinite bitmap, an infinite grayscale bitmap. Or, uh, you know, an int sized uh, grayscale bitmap. Okay, so if we know how to take the mean of, uh, so, so we have a cursor into our bitmap, so it's sort of a current location, an x and y coordinate. And we can say, we'll take the mean of all the surrounding pixels, just like the immediately surrounding pixels. Uh, we can then uh, extend that using the comonet to operate on the entire bitmap, and that will create a low-pass filter. So, and that looks like that. So we'll take a sharp image and turn it into a blurry one. And we can do this again. Uh, if we know how to take a, a low-pass uh, filter, then uh, we can use you know, our, our Comonet, our, our extend and, uh, and co-unit extract, uh, to take the difference between the low-pass filter and the identity, and that will give us an edge detector. Right? So, so all of this complex behavior, all of this, this cool stuff that we can do on like bitmaps and like stores and, and whatever, uh, and, and, and state machines, all of that stuff falls out of the simple fact that there is an isomorphism between curried and uncurried functions. Like everything else is just mechanically generated from that, uh, which I think is kind of awesome. Um, <coughs> all right. So yeah, it just falls out of this fact. That's it. OK, so that's an example of an adjunction in the category of Haskell types and functions. But most interesting adjunctions are in other categories, in categories that are not Hask. So uh, let's just look at some examples of those. But first, a little sort of short crash course on category theory. All right, so if we have a function, f, that goes from a to b at the top, we have another function, g, that goes from b to c, then we necessarily have a composite function, g compose f, that goes from a to c. And the implementation is lambda of x, g of f of x, right? Uh, and we say that this diagram commutes by which we mean that all the paths through this diagram are the same. Calling f and then calling g is the same as calling the composite function gf, uh, g compose f, sorry. And composition of functions is associative. That is, this diagram commutes. Uh, so it doesn't matter which path through this diagram we take. Uh, we end up at the same function f compose g compose h. Uh, sorry, h compose g compose f. Uh, you know, so we can, you know, we can call f followed by h compose g, or we can co call, uh, you know, f comp uh, g compose f followed by h. But uh, we get the same function ultimately. So composition of functions is associative. And then for every type, there's an identity function on that type that sort of does nothing, uh, which means that if we compose it, so we compose the identity with f, we get f. And if we compose f with the identity, we also get f. That is, these two diagrams also commute. So in general, uh, a category is given by some objects, some arrows between those objects, and a composition of those arrows that is associative and has an identity. That's it. So you, uh, so that's you know I don't know why everybody spent six hours in the category theory thing. <laughs> this this is all of it right here. So now everybody knows category theory. 
Uh, okay, so the category Hask of Haskell types and functions has, well, it has Haskell types as the objects, Haskell functions as the arrows, so not function types, but like actual functions as the arrows, and composition is the function composition, and it is associative, uh, and it has the identity, lambda of x, x. But not all categories have functions or even function-like things as arrows. There are lots of things, lots of categories that have uh, non-function-like things as, as arrows. Uh, so one example of this is uh, a category or kind of category called a poset, or a partially ordered set. Uh, so for instance, think of a, b, and c as being integers. Then, uh, so the integers form a category in the, in the sense that there is, there's an arrow from every integer uh, to, uh, to every other that is bigger than it. So, so at these arrows point up. So there's an arrow from A to B exactly when A is less than or equal to B. And then there's an arrow from B to C exactly when B is less than or equal to C. And that fact amounts to uh, the fact that, that A is less than or equal to C, that is there's, an, there's a composite arrow from A to C. All right? So composition here just means a transitivity uh, relationship. And there's an identity arrow on every integer. That is, every integer is less than or equal to itself. And uh, the composition of these arrows is associative. That is, it doesn't matter which path we take through this to reason uh, about the fact that a is less than or equal to d, we always end up at that same fact. So any path through this graph uh, or the, through this, uh, this diagram uh, represents the fact that a is less than or equal to d, right? That is, this, uh, this diagram commutes. So composition is associative in the poset. Okay, so in uh, integer arithmetic, uh, we, we, we have this simple relationship among multiplication and division. Um, and if we know how to multiply, uh, we, can, we can use this relation here to specify how to divide on the integers. And this is going to be universal, so for all x, y, and z, which are integers, but uh, y is going to be greater than zero, so we don't get you know, uh, strange results. Uh, so what this says is that uh, z times y is going to be less than or equal to x exactly when z is less than or equal to x divided by y. Remember, this is on the integers. Right, so x divided by y is, what this is saying is that x divided by y is some integer which is greater than all the z's, which, when multiplied by y, uh, is less than x. That is... Would we need to say that these are potentially not integers since division is not... Just to get, I mean... Sorry, what? Well, we're, we're doing division, but it, uh, integers aren't closed under division, so how are we resolving that? Uh, well, I, I think I'm resolving it by the fact that y is greater than zero. I think that's all I need, really. Yeah, well, no, no, even seven, still, like five divided, divided by four. two is not an integer. It's not an integer. Seven divided by so four. The argument is that division is not closed. Oh, oh, I, I know what you mean. Oh, yeah, but this is integer division, so we're going to have some remainder. Yeah, 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 sorry, that's, sorry. That's what I thought. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So x divided by y is going to have some remainder. We might lose that remainder, which is why, if we divide by y, we divide x by y, and then multiply by y we get something less than or equal to x because we may have lost our remainder. And that fact is our unit. Right? There's an arrow from you know, x divided by y times y to x. And then the co-unit is the, is the converse, which says that, well, if we multiply by y uh, and then divide by y again, we should end up where we started or above. It's actually always going to be the same place we started, but you know, that's cool. So this is actually a relationship between two monotone functions, uh, multiplied by y and divide by y. I'm going to call those f and g. So this is now starting to look a little bit like uh, the, the stuff that we have before. And then our unit is going to go from f of g of x to x, so there's an arrow in this category, and the co-unit is from z to g of f of z. Now note that the, so these monotone functions are functors. They are uh, endofunctors in the integers as a poset considered as a category. Right? So this less than or equal to relationship here is in an arrow in that category, uh, and, and it points up. Right? It points from less to greater. All right, so, so that's an adjunction in uh, 
the, the post sets, the post set of the, of the integers. Great. Uh, let's take a totally different example. Let's go to, go to something else. Uh, uh, it's not totally different, but whatever. Okay, so, so if, for those who were in the keynote this morning, um, Paul talked about, you know, like objects and then concepts, like formal, formal concept uh, analysis. Uh, so, so if we think of, uh, just think, think of the universe of objects in this room. It's like the stuff that's in this room. And think of being able to uh, collect those objects into, into collections, just arbitrary collections, you know, like this guy over here and like that seat over there or, or something, or the carpet and the ceiling or something. Uh, and so there's going to be a subset relationship or, or a, a sub, uh, sub collection relationship uh, where the collection C1 is going to be below C2 when C2 contains all of C1, right? And then uh, we're going to, so that's going to form a category. Uh, so the arrow is going to be this sort of subset relationship. And there's going to be an identity thing which, because, you know, every collection contains itself. Uh, and it's going to be uh, associative. So this is going to form a poset, essentially. Okay. And then we're going to have a different category, which is going to be descriptions or classifiers or concepts. Uh, you can think of these as the sets of attributes or, uh, or the formal concepts from, from Paul's talk this morning. And so well, those are going to be our, our descriptions of the objects in our, in our universe. So for example, you know, we could say like uh, seat or something. And that's going to like imply all the attributes of seats. And, uh, and there's going to be a relationship between these concepts, like when D1 is more specific than D2. Like you'll notice that like every other seat has like a different pattern on it in this room. And so you could say like, you know, checkered seat, and then you're going to get half the seats. I mean, it's going to classify half the seats in this room, right? So and there's going to be a, a sort of a subclass relationship here. D1 is going to be below D2 when D1 is more specific than D2, that it has more attributes than D2. Cool? So both of these are, are posets. Um, so we're going to have two functions here, uh, describe and examples. Uh, so describe is going to give us, uh, for any collection we have of objects, it's going to give us the best fit, the, the, the most specific description that we can, that we can think of uh, that describes all of the objects in our collection. And then examples is going to give us all the examples of the concept that, that we have, all right? So it's going to give us a collection that is as big as possible. And what I'm going to say is that describe, if you, say, if you take some examples of a, of a description and then you describe all of those examples, you're going to get something that is a more specific description than you started with. Like for example, if you say, oh, uh, your description is seat, and then you say, well, give me all the examples of seats, and you get all the seats in here. And then you describe the seats. Now you're going to get like auditorium seat, which is like more specific. All right? Uh, and then conversely, if you say, describe some examples, and then give me all the examples of that description, you're going to get something that's much bigger than the examples you started with, you know? Like if you say, like, this person over here, describe them, and then it's going to say, well, person. Then you say, okay, give me all the examples, and it's going to give you all the people. Yes. Uh, when you're saying like, using the word best, are you talking like on the level of like universal properties? Yeah. When you say when you so the question is when I say best, what I mean? Uh, I mean if you consider like a universe of descriptions, like some fixed thing that you have. Like let's let's just say that it's finite. Uh, then then describe is going to look through that and give me uh, the description has like the most attributes. And what it's going to amount to in practice is that it, when you go back to examples, you're going to get the largest set of examples. No, sorry, the smallest set of examples. OK. Um, so yeah, this is a one-to-one -one relationship between arrows in these two categories. Right? So the functions examples and describe are functors between these two categories. Uh, and, and describe is left adjoint to examples. Right? Okay, articulate again what describe does. Just the uh, E subset examples describe the 
Oh, what this low, this bottom one? Oh yeah. So this bottom one uh, says that if you take an ex if you take a, c a collection of examples, and you say describe those examples by giving a concept, then take give me all the examples of that concept. I'm gonna get something that is larger than the e the example I started with, right? Uh, because there may be more examples of that concept than than the one I just than I had. Cool. Uh, yeah. So this is an adjunction. Awesome. Uh, between between uh, these two two post sets. Great. Uh, let's look at another example. Uh, so let's use an adjunction now to solve a simple API design problem. Okay. So this is pretty bad. Like I'm going to say, okay, well I have an equality on A. So given an A and a list of A, give me the index of of the A I gave you uh, in that list. So this, is, this might be problematic because that element might not exist in that list. So then what am I going to do? This is an API design question. Like how do I, how do I actually uh, do something here? So there are a number of things I could do uh, in an ad hoc fashion. Right? I could say, well, just return ne negative 1 or infinity or well, negative infinity, not a number. Or, you know, hey, let's just do like null. Like <laughs> for all AA, you figure it out. Um, but all of these are sort of ad hoc things, and, and these are all things that people have done, right? Like we've seen these in, in lots of programming languages. So we don't want to do that. What we actually want is uh, we want some point in the answer uh, that is special, right? So what we actually want is a pointed set. We want the, the, the return type to be a pointed set. And a pointed set is just a type, it's a, it's a set that has a distinguished member. A, a point of type A. So it's a, it's a set A that has a, has a distinguished point of type A. Okay? So um, if we had such a distinguished point, then we would be able to pick that point out in our answer in a sort of a non-ad hoc fashion. Okay, so knowing nothing else about a given type, can we turn that type into a pointed type in a formulaic, universal way, making no ad hoc choices? We can because we have a functor that goes from the pointed types to the types. That is, you know, if you have the, the, the types that have like, you know, points, elements of those types are special, we can forget the point and just have the type. And that's a functor. The, the functor goes from the, the, the pointed types to the ordinary types without the, without the points. So this fun forgetful functor u takes the type x and it forgets the point of x and gives the underlying type. That functor has a left adjoint that goes from the types to the pointed types and that is going to be the free pointed type. So for any type x, p of x, the left adjoint of u, is going to be a pointed type. Um, <clears throat> right, so, so there's going to be a one-to-one -one correspondence here between these, between these, two, uh, between these two things. Right. So the blue stuff here is, is uh, pointed types and, and homomorphisms on pointed types. That is, functions that preserve the points. That's the blue stuff. And the red stuff uh, is ordinary types and functions. Okay? So on the left, we have homomorphisms on pointed types. And on the right, we have ordinary types uh, and functions. Okay, so this type here, A to U of B. So U of B takes the pointed type B and just gives us the type B. So let's just do that. So now we just have, well, there's going to be some correspondence between the functions from A to B and the pointed set homomorphisms between P of A to B, where P of A is, is whatever our free pointed set is. We don't know yet what that is. But this actually completely specifies what that is, the fact that this is an isomorphism. So we can just like turn the crank on this adjunction. Um, so the, the right adjunct, uh, so the, the, the witness, uh, that takes pointers to uh, ordinary sets. Uh, sorry, the pointer set homomorphisms to ordinary functions. Uh, no, that's the other way around. Uh, so that, that right thing takes a function from A to B and tur turns it into a pointer set homomorphism. The left adjunct thing takes a pointed set homomorphism and turns it into a function. And we're going to have a co-unit, which takes a, you know, given a pointed B, takes a P of B and turns it into a B. And a unit, given an A, turns it into a P of A. Right? Uh, so we can simplify 
uh, some of this. Like we can get rid of um, this pointed thing because all that's given us is, is a value of type B. So we can just replace that with, with an argument of type B. Okay? So then that's going to look like that. So what we then need is notice this type at the top. All right, so this function is going to give, uh, it's going to give us a b at the end. And it's going to be given a b and a function from a to b. And so what it could do is one of two things. It could even either return the b it was given, or it could somehow use p of a, because like have an a inside of it, uh, and pass that to the function from a to b. Okay? And we know that we can construct a p of a out of an a using our unit. So you know, there's at least one way that that p of a could have an a. Right? Okay, so we can actually just take this top thing here and just put that in a data type and say, like, well, anything that implements this interface is going to be our free pointed type. Right? And we're actually done. So this is our answer. So p of integer is going to be what we want to return. But this actually turns out to be isomorphic to maybe. Um, so uh, our, our right adjunct, or the thing that takes the, the uh, ordinary functions to the, uh, to the pointed functions, I was point is set homomorphisms, is the maybe function, which is sort of the fold of the maybe data type. And our unit is going to be just. So uh, our maybe a is going to be nothing or just a. And in the case that we don't have the element, we're just going to return nothing. And then, um, you know, whoever is using our API is going to figure out what to do in the case of nothing. If we continue turning the crank on this adjunction, we're going to get a join for the maybe monad. And we're going to get a duplicate for maybe co-monad. But that co-monad is not in the category hask. It is a co-monad in the category of pointed types on hask. Pretty great. Uh, so yeah, we just do this. The answer is you need a pointed type. And which one? Well, just use the free one. Um, and you just get that by you know, taking the left adjoint, uh, adjoint of, uh, of the forgetful thing. Uh, and we can repeat this same mechanism. It's a completely mechanical transformation that we can do to get free monoids, uh, which turns out to be lists, uh, finite lists. We can get free monads. We can get uh, you know, free all kinds of algebraic data structures. Uh, and all we have to do is to just put monoid or monad or whatever into this adjunction, and then we just turn the crank, and out pops our free monoid or our free monad. Um, and forgetful functions also sometimes have right adjoints. Um, so if, for example, if we have, we want a co-monad, we have a forgetful functor from the category of co-monads to the category of functors, we can just say, well, what is the right adjoint of that? And then we get a co-free co-monad. And if you're interested in that stuff, like talk to me after. <laughs> okay, another example. All right, we're just gonna like crank through these examples until we're blue in the face. Okay, so uh, given two objects, A and B, in any category, don't care what category this is, can we approximate a notion of both A and B? Like whatever that might mean in this category. Uh, we wanna like, sort of like take the product of A and B. Uh, no, we don't know what this category is, but we don't have to know. Uh, but we don't want anything ad hoc in our solution, right? It, this has to work systematically. Okay, and it has to work universally for for and, and identically for any A and B, right? And it also has to has to work identically for any category for which this works. Good question. So yeah. Because we can get product when we know how to build a product. We don't need to go through the adjunction. What you're saying is that somehow the extra that we get from this is that there's a type of extra You don't know. How do you know how to build a product? Oh, this isn't necessarily the, fun the category of types and functions, right? So you don't, you don't know how to build a product. So let's, let's you know, go through this and do this for, for all categories in which this works. Okay, so for any two categories C and D, these are any two categories C and D, there's going to be a product category C cross D, uh, which we can construct purely category theoretically. I'm just going to wave my hands. But, the, you know, just take my word for it that there's a product category C cross D where the objects are pairs of objects. One is from C and the other one is from D. And there are arrows, which are pairs of arrows. One of them is from C and the other one is from D. And then they're going to line up like pairwise. Right? So if you have an object in C and an object in, in D side by side, 
you're going to have like arrows out of them in exactly the same way that, that was in, uh, in the category C and D. Okay? Now, for any given category, um, if we take the product of that category with itself, uh, we can take a diagonal functor from that category to the product category of C with itself. So, uh, what this thing is going to do is on objects, it's just going to pair up an object with itself. So, given, a, given an object C in our category C, it's going to just say, well, C and C. Great. And then on arrows, it's going to say, well, just pair up the arrows. If I have a, an arrow F, pair F with itself. This is going to be my functor. It's like a super simple construction. Simplest thing that could possibly work. Okay. So we don't know, know what our product is going to be, but, but there's an adjunction that can give this to us. So we can ask, what is the right adjoint to this delta functor? We're going to call this pi. And if it exists, this is going to find us our product. So following the pattern, uh, the adjunction is going, to, is going to look like this. There's going to be an isomorphism on arrows. So I've used double arrows to, work, to note that we're working in the product category. Like this is, these are pairs of arrows, right, uh, on the left. And on the right, these are just ordinary, ordinary arrows from C. Okay, so there's going to be an isomorphism between these, uh, uh, these arrows. These, these, uh, so wherever we have an arrow from delta of A to pair with B and C, uh, we're going to have an arrow from A to pi of B with C, whatever pi is, which is going to be our product. Okay, so uh, we can actually span this out because we know the definition of delta on A is just A with itself. So this is saying now isomorphism on, on pairs of arrows, so one from A to B and the other one from A to, A to C. Uh, or, you know, yeah, it goes from, from the object, you know, A comma A to, the, to B comma C. And this pi B comma C, I don't, I don't quite like that notation, so I'm just going to say B cross C and sort of pun on that. So that's going to be our product, B cross C. Uh, and so we actually know that this double arrow represents pairs of arrows in the other category. So let's just make that explicit and say like, well, if we have pairs of arrows, one from A to B and the other one from A to C, I'm going to now get an arrow from A to B cross C, whatever that is, and vice versa. And wherever this works, B cross C is going to be our product. Okay, so this is saying that, uh, that the product of B and C is some object B cross X, such that for every other object with arrows into B and C, every other object A uh, from objects with arrows into B and C, there's going to be some unique arrow from A into B cross C. Right? So this is a specification for our product, and that's all of it. So expanding that out, we can say like that, uh, right, so there's going to be, if we take B cross C and we stick it in for our, our A, so we take the identity on, on the left side, uh, sorry, on the right side, then we get our unit and, uh, no, sorry, this is going to be our, our co-unit. And our co-unit in the product category is going to be a pair of arrows, one from B cross C to B, and the other one from B cross C to C, okay? And yeah, this is saying that, that, then, that, that for every object, A, with arrows into B and C, there's going to be an arrow from A to B cross C, uniquely. That's going to be a one-to-one -one thing. That is, this diagram is going to commute, going to commute. And you know, if you're into category theory, that's going to look familiar. It's going to be the product uh, diagram. Uh, so B cross C is, in some sense, the ultimate objects with arrows into both B and C. Because for every other object A, there's going to be an arrow into it. Every other A with arrows into B and C. Okay? And then our uh, co-product, uh, what falls out of this in, in, in Hask, is going to be the, the tuple type. So uh, B comma C. Uh, and that's going to be sort of our Cartesian product. And our projections are going to be first and second. So first and second together form our, our co-unit. All right, but then in a different category, so it's, it's, pretty, it's pretty obvious, like you mentioned, like you pointed out, it's pretty obvious what this is in uh, the category of sets and, or types. It's going to be the Cartesian product on sets. But in a totally different category, we can actually figure this out as well. So if this is our specification, so given 
you know, any pair of arrows from, uh, you know, one from A to B and, and the other one from A to C, we should be able to get an arrow from A to, to B cross C, whatever that is. So let's take a poset category. So in a poset category, this is now saying that the product of B and C is some object, B cross C, uh, that is going to be above every object that is above, uh, no, sorry, that is below both B and C, right? So it's greater than or equal to any A that is less than or equal to both B and C. Okay, right, so what, what, is that? what does that mean? Uh, so we're going to have our, our co-unit and our unit. And our co-unit is just going to say that, well, okay, B cross C is going to be less than or equal to B, and B cross C is going to be less than or equal to C. So I'm just turning the crank on the adjunction. And then our unit is going to be the fact that A is less than or equal to A cross A. Okay, so this is saying that the product of B and C is some object B cross C that is going to be below every other object uh, B and C. Uh, I mean, it's going to be below both B and C. So it's going to be uh, there, it's going to be a, a, a lower bound, right? I think so. Let me cheat. Uh, yes, it's going to be a lower bound for B and C. But the top thing here is saying that it's going to be the greatest such bound. Right? It's going to be greater than every A that is a lower bound for B and C. Right? So it's the greatest lower bound of B and C. So that's our product in the POSET category. And if we flip all the arrows, we get a coproduct in our category. And that's just going to work exactly the same way, totally the same reasoning. And that's going to be the least upper bound of B and C, right? And in uh, general, uh, in sort of sub subset categories or poset categories, uh, le least upper bounds are going to be left adjoint to this kind of diagonal factor, and greatest lower bounds are going to be right adjoint to diagonal factors. And in Hask, the coproduct is going to be either, and the product is going to be tuple. And in, and in general, you know, sums are left adjoint to diagonals, which are left adjoint to products. Right, so if, if I ever get a neck tattoo, like, that's going to be it. <laughs> right? And other mathematicians are going to see me on the train, and they're going to look at me, and they're like, <laughs> you know, it's going to be awesome. So uh, an awesome thing to sort of include conclusion, we can actually use this fact um, to do generic programming. So generally, it's enough to know only half of an adjunction, and then we can mechanically derive the other one. So actually, if we know any two of f, g, p, and q, we can derive the others. Uh, and this composes, right? So if f is left adjoint to g, and p is left adjoint to q, then fp, or the composite of f and p, is left adjoint to gq. And, and people are using this to do generic programming. So there's an awesome paper by Ralph Hinze called Generic Programming with Adjunctions, where we can do program derivation just by figuring out what are the left and right adjoints of some functors. And there's a really cool one called Galculator, functional prototype of a Galois connection-based proof assistant, uh, <coughs> which you should definitely check out. Uh, it's, it's a little dense, but um, yeah, so a Galois connection is a, an adjunction in a POSET category. Uh, so, um, so yeah, let's look for adjunctions. Like, I, I really want to see more adjunctions. There were some awesome examples of adjunctions in, uh, during this conference. Like, there was one where they were deriving um, database migrations using adjunctions. Uh, and there was another one. I forget what that was. But uh, I'll remember in a second. So, so yeah, I, I really want to see more of this. Like, I want to see people looking for adjunctions uh, that, that can you know, do this, this work of like generating a natural solution to a problem uh, that is like totally not ad hoc. Uh, so just as a point of uh, intuition, so uh, adjunctions in a certain sense like resolve tensions between trade-offs. Like you don't have to necessarily make um, ad hoc decisions, you know, to, to decide how to, you know, fall on one side or the other of these trade-offs. You can use an adjunction to just sort of resolve that tension for you. Uh, in a certain sense, I want to say that an adjunction will sort of find an optimal surface between a, a problem space and a solution space. 
uh, in like the keynote uh, this morning where he was talking about squares in that concept matrix. So those squares in the concept matrix are surfaces like this that, that you know, where, where like the problem space and the solution space sort of meet in an interesting optimal way. Right? So let's be looking for those. So whenever we're looking for like general, natural, and elegant solutions, uh, yeah, let's just like express stuff as functors and find their adjuncts. Thank you.